right, without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speakers tonight. I have Tony Grogan from Spearboard. Hello. And, and I'm going to butcher your last name, Chris. <laughs> yes, I bet you are. <laughs> it's Chris Malinowski, I'll just say it. So Malinowski. You know. <laughs> And uh, Chris and Tony work together, um, so we decided to have them come together and give you a great presentation tonight about Goliath Groupers. So enjoy. Thank you. I'm Tony Grogan, and uh, this right here is my good friend Jim McGrath. How many of you here know him? He worked at 4C, Scott knows him, for 13 years. So it's me and and Jim, and then various scientists like Chris Malinowski, Jim Lac Chris is with uh, FSU, and uh, Jim Lacasio is with Moat Marine Lab. We're doing a major project on acoustics and sonar and all kinds of cool things, passive, active acoustics. I'm gonna mention that at the very end. And then, uh, I work a lot with a guy named Dr. Chris Koenig. I've been working with him for about 12 years, going way back when he first started uh, Goliath Research over here in uh, Palm Beach County. He's based at FSU, but he's retired, but he's still very active. Chris Malinowski, who you'll meet in a minute, he's a PhD candidate at Florida State. I actually met him on my boat when he came with Dr. Koenig and was doing research and also Mike Newman, Captain Mike Newman's boat up there in Jupiter. He does, he's done a lot of research on Goliaths right here in Palm Beach County, even though he's up in Tallahassee. He's got a focus on uh, some of his current work is on bioaccumulation patterns of mercury in, in the Goliath grouper, which he'll go into. Use mercury is, is one of the most toxic um, heavy metals and, and pollutants that we worry about for a lot of reasons. Three main ones is that one, we have more than triple the amount of mercury in the environment uh, since the Industrial Revolution, so there's a lot more of it out there. Um, it's very harmful, a very dangerous toxicant because it's persistent, stays in the environment for a long time, it's globally distributed, it can actually in some form stay atmospheric for over a year, so it can come from places like China and all the way to some of the most pristine places in, um, that haven't been touched, like lake systems and, 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 and the marine system and it biomagnifies in some form, so that's what we're really interested in, especially a Goliath grouper, because they're so big and long-lived, they can accumulate stuff that, um, over time in, in great numbers. And so and then, of course, we're also really interested with, with marine seafood, especially as the, the effects to us. And so the effects that human consumers get from eating these toxic-laden fish is the same issues that a lot of fish have, right? They're living in this aquatic medium. They're dealing with this on a daily basis. They can't control um, how much mercury they're taking in by controlling their diet. And so we've, I know somebody always asks this question. It's a little off-center. Um, how do Goliath grouper compare to other grouper species, right? Well, around Florida um, and around the world, they are the highest of any grouper that's been recorded. So um, if you look at sort of, and, and they're from various places, of course, based on size and various geographical locations, it, it'll vary, but this, this is from our study. So mean 1.52, this means nothing to you right now. I'll show you a slide later where these values will mean something. Uh, maximum up to 4.15, that's really high. And if you compare that down to say black grouper, which a lot of people compare to, we got these economic species, they're right in line with the mean value um, to some extent, but, but, don't, but they're much less variable, so they don't get as much mercury in their system as maximum amounts that Goliath do. All right, and because the mercury is, is accumulated in a lot of these fish, we have um, FWC and, and uh, the Department of Health and other agencies put out the, these health restriction estimates of what you should eat. So if we compare Goliath grouper to other species that we would potentially consume, like the black grouper that I just showed you, well, the restrictions on that, especially for pregnant women in, in this column, right, that's uh, mercury is most toxic to pregnant women because methylmercury, especially in the dangerous form, can, has the potential to cross the blood-brain barrier and the placenta. And so often there will be different restrictions for a female diet and pregnant women diet more than the rest of the population. So if we look here, one per month for black grouper, that's not a lot, and that's one, one serving, which is six ounces, which is about the size of the palm of your hand. Right? And, and one per week for the rest of the population is about the maximum that agencies will tell you to eat. Um, other than when you get into like tunas and sharks where they say do not eat for pregnant women, right? So Goliath grouper are higher than this, so keep that in mind. Not really a good consumption fish anyway. So I'm going to jump right into just the results. 
um, to keep things moving on, on Mercury. So what this slide is here is this is white muscle on the y-axis, right? So this is the muscle, this is the meat that you would eat if you, if you ate the fish. And down here, total length also is a proxy for age. We know this is pretty strongly correlated. So white muscle values of mercury and the length of the fish. And the first thing I want you to notice is I talked about the health advisories before. I drew this line here at 0.3 parts per million, so that value makes sense now. And, and these are limitations to what you should be consuming based on these levels. So these are, every dot on here is an individual fish that I've looked at, right? And so every one of these is above EPA's already pretty, pretty liberal, in my, in my viewpoint, level of, of consumption of this fish or of, of mercury. So all of these individuals, these are all adults here too, I'm not showing you juveniles yet, um, so 110 centimeters up, um, all above, even, even when you go to other agencies, NRDC and in the FDA, which is for legal sale of this fish, most are above that too. So, that's, so even if we were to open this up for fishing, not advised to eat most of these fish anyway. All right, and so the other important part I talked about the differences in sex is this has become a really interesting part of my dissertation work. What I'm finding is, is very consistently and significantly is, is males, which are in these red triangles here compared to the females in, in blue dots, are significantly higher in mercury than females. And so I've been trying to figure out why this is. What is this pattern and why does it exist? And so you'll see this in muscle. I'll we'll come back to this because I added a slide in here on juveniles. Um, we'll see the same thing in other tissues as well. So here I just wanted to throw this one in here too. This is actually from another paper. I didn't have time to put my juvenile mercury data in here. Um, there's been other reports of Goliath grouper and, and other groupers around Florida. And this actually shows the juveniles here. So I put this blue line here showing mature, immature. So around age seven or 100 centimeters is generally when they move from the mangroves to the offshore reefs with the adult population. And so if you look at this side, I kind of showed you my data over here. And, and and these are all pretty small fish too. But if we look at what's happening here in, in the juveniles, this is about the only case where you might want to consume this fish. So it, it adds to the, the potential for opening up juveniles for um, if you're going to have to open up a fishery, these would, this is where you'd want for the recovery of the population, also for your own safety and consumption, right? So even a lot of the juveniles are above the EPA's line, um, but it's a safer zone than the adults for sure, and definitely more consistent. Um, and if you go up to FDA, you know, they're all below that. So juveniles are definitely lower in mercury, and, and this is the case for most species, right? The bigger they are, the older they are, the more mercury. So the younger, smaller, tastier even. Um, you know, even the big ones probably don't taste very good from what I've heard. You get some individuals, especially the males up here, that are some 15 times higher than, than EPA's limit. So you're really taking a gamble if you're eating the adults. And we see a similar thing in, in the liver. Um, I would say the, the muscle is primarily methylmercury, more toxic form of mercury. Inorganic, which is in the liver, which I'm showing here, is still very toxic, but, but not as of the tox toxic form to human consumers. The liver, of course, is where we detoxify and process mercury, so it's more toxic to the animal that it's in. Um, and here we see, if you look at this value, 35, almost 35 parts per million. I'm talking about 0 0.3 parts per million being the limit. That's 115 times higher than what you can um, healthily consume. And so that's definitely having a large effect on these fish, um, having that processing that, that level of mercury in their liver, right? And so you see the same pattern then with males in the liver as well as the muscle being much higher. Very interesting pattern. And of course, it's important to talk about the liver because apparently this was a big consumption item when Goliath were being um, harvested. This was a big cuisine item and, and especially the key. So if you're going to eat Goliath grouper, do not eat their liver is my only advice. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we do know that a lot of the effects that happen to fish also happen to, to humans. The, the, the symptoms are very similar. Of course, the fish don't talk, much like our animals don't talk when we take them into the vet. So we have to put them through a bunch of different tests to see what's actually happening. Um, but we can point to human studies, right? I mean, humans, uh, we know a lot of the major effects that humans have experienced over time. A perfect example is, is the Mad Hatter, which you all know from Alice in Wonderland. Well, he actually is probably mad, but it's not from whatever they pitch him as in, in that story. It's from mercury exposure, right? So there's a whole process of matting hats from the 1850s to the 1900s where they actually used mercury to, to mat the felt down of the hats. And people were having all the symptoms of mercury from ataxia, um, involuntary control of their muscle movement, uh, even through things like loss of teeth. I mean, anything neurological or endocrine disruption that you can imagine, right? So 
Um, and, and the hatter shakes were often considered um, or thought to be drunkenness too, right? So tremors and then shaking and slurred speech that are often associated with mercury are often, so they just think people were drunk coming to work. So nobody knew what was happening, right? So this is the big effect. Also, we had a big example. I'm assuming some people know about this. This is often presented in when people talk about mercury. Is Minamata disease, um, which was really discovered in, in about the 50s, even though there was this, this chemical co corporation in Japan that was pumping out mercury into the wastewater for over 30 years, and people were eating fish out of this water and getting sick. It wasn't recognized until almost um, a decade or two later, and people were, I mean, kids were you know, completely in voluntary control, even, even dying from mercury in, in very high toxic forms. So we know it has a huge effect. And so it has the same effect on fish, just not as easy to tell. So one of the big things that we look at that I'm not going into detail here today is but, but liver damage, right? So that's where they get a lot of the mercury that's detoxifying, they're trying to get rid of it. But that's where a lot of the damage happens too. They can only take so much. So you get things like swelling of, of liver cells, um, loss of lipids, and that's their, their energy reserve, right? So if they don't have the energy, that's, what, that's also where they're pushing that out to their eggs. The liver directly puts um, fat into the eggs so they can survive. So it affects that, it lo loss of the energy. And lesion, so cellular lesion, actually breaks down the tissue in the, in the liver. And, and I've looked at a lot of slides and we're seeing a lot of um, examples of this happening in, in these fish. And this is mostly inorganic. You also see this with methyl, but methyl is a really dangerous one, if you remember. And so you get all these things like neurological impairment, loss of coordination, um, even things like diminished swimming ability because you don't have the same ability to, to move around or to feed. It has, has a big indirect effect on their survival. Um, down through starvation, malnutrition, we see a lot of examples of that from doing our blood work. Even, even potentially down to mortality levels, which we can't prove, but we can, but we can estimate and potentially um, come up to some idea of this might be happening. And of course, all of these effects come down to a main population dynamic. If you're trying to manage a population, you're really considering their growth of the population, their survival, and their, and their offspring output, output. So mercury has a, have an effect on all of these parameters that go into a growth model. And we know from the levels that we're seeing in the eggs, that there is a there, there's a potential for a huge effect on offspring survival and viability um, you know, based on these levels. So you, you can easily get things like um, deformation, scoliosis, loss of their, their energy sac, um, and things like that. So these larvae would not exist or be able to survive at some of these high toxic levels that we're, that we're finding. And then lastly, from you know, all of the fish that we've collected over the years, we, we, Tony talked about our mark and recapture. He, we, you know, we pit tag them, we put different, we redundantly tag them so that we don't lose um, tags, so we know that we're recapturing a fish. But one of the really important things is that if we look at the largest individuals in the population, the ones that are over 190 centimeters, they are reca the, the large males specifically are recaptured at a, at a significantly lower rate than the females in the same size range, right? And as a, um, opposed to also the, um, the recapture rates of smaller males and females being, being the same. So that means that large males are being lost from the population. Could mean that they're being lost because of um, these high mercury loads that we're seeing. Could also be from their behavioral interaction, the males with fishing lines, maybe they're being poached. We don't know, but we do know that we're losing these large males from the population.